afternoon, everyone. Nice to be here again. See so many of you, actually. Uh, I'll make this very short because no one has a lot to tell you. Um, I'll just tell you that... Apparently you can't hear me. Um, I'll keep this short. Uh, basically, Norman is back here. When he's not here, he's in Malta, continuing his struggle, as always. Uh, perhaps you all know he, he was, um, he got a four year, uh, two year term to spend the four years, which means he's practically muzzled in our country, Could but the goes on. I'll try. Um, uh, I don't think I have much else to say, actually. Norman, could you please take over? Where is he? Well, as we say, with women like these on our side, how can we lose? <laughs> yes, as Etoile was saying, um, I've been up, going up to court for goodness scores of time. Given this suspended sentence, I feel now the constitutional appeal, the final, uh, uh, which is very important, like I'm, I'm being charged exactly on the points Gerd Wilders, exactly, 84, whatever your law here, racial incitement, exactly the same, you see, all over Europe. And so it's very important, this thing. Now, the president of the court, the Supreme Court, three judges, but the president of the court re retired some time ago, and he reserved judgment on my case on the very day he retired. Everybody thought that he would deliver a test case piece of, guess what? He uh, passed the buck to his successor. And guess who his successor is? The prosecuting officer, the, pros the attorney general, who started proceedings in the first place against me. So now <laughs> it's unbelievable, you know, only mortar. But this, this shows you this charade of democracy we are living in. And when the third and fourth persons in the country, because first there's the president of the country, prime minister, then president of the court, and the attorney general, when the number three and number four shirk their responsibility in such an abject manner, that country is uh, it's finished, you see. And the effect of such shirking of responsibility will percolate, will percolate down throughout society. And uh, this is it. This is not just in Malta. This is everywhere. Anyway, let me get down straight away to my subject. Today, we're going to talk about implementing the imperial. Now, I've been here before three times elucidating this concept, this idea of Imperium Europa, step by step, every year here. And now is the time to speak about implementing all that we have been speaking about. For those who are interested in the whole sequence of thoughts, you can view the YouTubes of the, the stocks in the new, at the new right here. <coughs> Uh, on our website, imperium-europa.org, and listen to them and hear this evolving idea. Now, uh, yes, here I've got three books, a complete ideology in order to save our race, this biological aristocracy of 5% of the world's population and declining fast. Our race, our high culture, and our civilization. The first book needs no introduction. 
Imperium by Francis Parker, Yockey, a political genius, murdered by the eternal enemy. He died poisoned in an FBI, uh, under FBI custodianship. He was the most dangerous man in the world, in the eyes of our enemies. And he was murdered. He wrote this tremendous book where just after the war, 46, 47, 48, he had this burning idea of Imperium already. Incredible, you know, to think of an empire at that time. It's not easy. And he, he wrote this book in Ireland. And uh, he stopped at a certain point. Why? Because he was in Zugzwang. Now anybody who plays chess here knows what Zugzwang is. Zugzwang in chess means that it's your move, but whatever you move, you lose. Because you're out of tempo. And Francis Parker Yockey was out of tempo. He was against time. He was ahead of time. Savitri Devi, about whom I'm very, very much anxious to hear Jonathan Baldwin speak later. So there he was. He was in Zugzwang. Why? Because of the Iron Curtain splitting Europe. He had to choose. There was no political space, neither for Oswald Mosley, who chose West, neither for Derriard, who chose East, and neither for Yoki, who again chose East. Why? There was no space, because the Warsaw Pact and NATO <laughs> two sides of the same coin, run by cousins in Moscow, Tel Aviv, London, and Washington. You, you couldn't move because they had us. They had Europe prostrate, you see, for 50 years. So he couldn't move. He was in Zugzwang. He, he had to stop. There was no maneuver. Even Evola, Julius Evola, didn't give any political uh, solution. All he said, we must, we must take back the Japanese islands of Sakhalin or the Kuril Islands, I think. That's, that, that's the only space there was. Let's get the Japanese to take those islands back, and then perhaps we will take back our territory from the Soviets. When a chap like Evola comes out with such a solution, you, you see how how tight the political situation was for everybody. So uh, he, 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 he just couldn't move. He moved as Oswald Mosley, as Tyria, as far as they could, but they had no elbow space, political elbow space. Now, I waited 20 years for somebody to take up where Yoki left off. Nobody did. Why? Not because for lack of bright people in our movement, of course, we've got scores of them. Libraries full of our thoughts, you see, but we are busy tearing each other up, sniding at each other. This is, this is it, everybody digging his little furrow, no high thinking. Nobody raised his sights up practically till today, except for the new right, which comes out with with new ideas. So I had to I had to take this thing, this Imperium idea of uh, of Yorkie. Because there was nobody else, you know, Shakespeare. I had I had greatness trust upon me. And uh, uh, had he been alive, Yoki, had he not been murdered, because he had no cause or reason, a man in his prime at 35 or something, brilliant man, with his incomplete philosophy, he had everything to look forward to, no reason for suicide. So it's obvious, he was murdered. So had he been alive, he would have written the book I wrote.